Well, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. My name is Denise Demisi. I'm the Director of Faculty Development for the University System of Georgia. And I cannot imagine a more appropriate um, session for all of us right now than that which our presenters are offering about self-care and burnout resilience. Um, I think, yeah, I think we all need this, especially just considering our little snippet of conversation before we started. So I'm so happy to welcome Becky Johnston from University of North Georgia, Rebecca Pope Rourke from Georgia Tech, and Tamara Payne from Fort Valley State University. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to them. Thank you, Denise. Give me one second to share the screen. Okay, everybody see that in the right screen? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Rebecca Pope Rewark, and I'm with my colleagues, as Denise said, Becky Johnson and Tamara Payne. And we are here to talk to you really about what is self care, what is burnout, and how do we deal with those both as, um, as faculty, as human beings, and also what our students are going through as well. So, our agenda for today is to cover really three three sections. Um, thinking about how we define burnout, self-care, and trauma, because we are in trauma right now, right? How do we define those things? Um, and how do we define those things, especially burnout clinically, right? That is a clinical diagnosis there. Um, we're gonna look at and try to understand the eight dimensions of well-being and how you can apply those for yourself and for your students as well during these uncertain times. And then we're going to assess your virtual physical classroom practices so that you can deal with burnout and, and build that burnout resilience that is so important these days. We've been kind of wallowing in it for a long time. So how do we, how do we get through it? How do we stay stable? How do we help our students through it? So to get us started, I want you to just take a minute and read this little case scenario. I'll give you a minute just to read it. As you're finishing up reading it, just to yourself, just jot down a thought or two about what you think is happening to Chris in this particular case study. Just a note or two to yourself. All right, so I want you to hold on to those thoughts because we're going to come back to Chris in a little bit and we'll we'll touch base with them every once in a while throughout the presentation. So a few points that we want to ground this experience in and this workshop in is that we are all experiencing trauma right now. When we use this definition of trauma, it, we are all in this kind of psychological emotional space where we have to deal with the world around us and that world is chaotic, is uncertain, is confusing, and it seems unrelenting right now. We don't we don't know where the end is, and we don't know how we don't we don't know what's going to happen with our classes and with our families and with you know loved ones. We were just talking about flying around to see all our people. You know, when are we going to be able to do that? So we are all in that trauma. And as educators, and for those of you that are educational developers, there are multiple layers of trauma there, right? Because as individuals, um, we experience it. As people who work with our students, we might be experiencing their trauma as well in these complex times. And as educational developers, we're working with faculty who are working with students, right? So there are these different levels of responsibility and of concern and of, of caring that we have to manage in this, in this insane time right now. We may also, since we are experiencing this level of trauma, we may all be in some level of burnout, right? So burnout is classified as an occupational syndrome that results from chronic or prolonged workplace stress. It's not a mental disorder. It's not a mental illness. It's, it's a syndrome that can bring out things that you might be prone to. Depression, anxiety could be consequences of burnout. But it's essentially 
uh, a way of coping with that unrelenting stress. And there are three characteristics that that make up kind of the burnout definition. So the three major symptoms, and these have been validated over and over again in some form, the three symptoms are emotional and physical exhaustion. So you are at a place where, you know, your, your body is exhausted, your mind can't really process anything anymore. Um, you may be experiencing health issues related to your physical self or your emotional self. Um, you just don't have a lot in your well, in your reserves anymore. The second feature is a mental distancing or cynicism. This is particularly salient for people who are in caring professions. So teachers, social workers, healthcare workers of all, of all kinds, right? We are people who deeply care and build relationships with the people that we serve and that we work with. And that again can be at some point a level of secondary trauma, right? So as a coping mechanism for that, we might start distancing ourselves from our work. We might start distancing ourselves from those people, right? We might hit a level of what they call depersonalization where you stop seeing individual people and you start to see them kind of as a, as a group, right? So students don't become Abby and Brian and Kathy, they become the students and they're just kind of this one unit of things that are always in front of you or always want something from you. Um, so that distancing is a way to, to manage some of that stress for you. Um, and then finally, feelings of reduced personal efficacy. You may feel like you, people with burnout feel like they've kind of lost their purpose, they've lost their way, they don't see the value in what they're doing anymore. So it's like a why do I bother kind of situation. Um, and you don't feel like what you're doing is any good if you are doing it, right? So you may not be able to work or you may be mentally not in a place where it's, it's a time to be productive, right? I think that's one thing that we've seen a lot of, especially at the beginning of the pandemic on academic Twitter, were people lamenting the fact that they couldn't work, they couldn't be productive, right? Well, we're kind of all at the lower end of Maslow's hierarchy of needs right now, right? And potentially a place where we haven't been individually in a really long time. So being able to self-actualize and write some brilliant articles or a brilliant book might not be, cap we might not be capable of that right now. And giving ourselves some grace to be able to understand that and recognize that in, in this trauma and it, while we're experiencing this burnout, that that's okay. It's okay to not be okay right now. And if we're not okay, they probably aren't either. Just take a minute and think about your students. How are they presenting themselves? How are they, how are they distanced? How are, is their emotional um, or their physical health concerning? Are they stepping back, right? If we are in that mode, they probably are too, because they have a whole different type of trauma, right? We all have different layers and different strengths of trauma that we're, we're dealing with, right? And our students do too. And we don't know what's going on in their worlds or in their minds at all times. So we're all people and we're all struggling with the same kind of challenges in this time. So one thing that we wanna think about developing is burnout resistance. This doesn't mean kind of imperviousness, because it, we're going to go through cycles where we feel it potentially more than other times, <clears throat> excuse me. But the idea of burnout resilience is that you have strategies for when you start to feel maybe some of those symptoms come on or when you feel like your students maybe are in a place where it's, it's a time to work with them to let them know that it's okay because trauma, because burnout, we're all in it. How do we, how do we kind of stay above um, the choppy waters that we mentioned in our title. So burnout resilience is our goal here. So a little bit of discussion here in the chat, take a second. And when someone says that they practice, they practice self-care, what immediately comes to mind? So in like three words or less, just pop in the chat and share what you think people who say they have self-care talk about. And I'm pulling up my chat so I can see. So we've got some mindfulness, exercise and hobbies, meditation, spa days, technology breaks, a lot of mindfulness, exercise, 
Sleepy tea. Perfect. Love it. Okay. You're all are y'all are way more gracious than I expected with this question. I think usually when we talk about self-care, we think about things like getting a massage or taking a day off or taking a long weekend and going to the beach, right? I think those those we can be a little stereotypical with what that means particularly, but I think as self-care becomes more important and more crucial to all of us, we are starting to see these other things come up and we are starting to take it more more um more specifically, I see light a candle, listen to music and heavy drinking. That's a good one too. Sometimes <laughs> it feels like that's what we need. <laughs> All right, so when we think about self-care, we can think about these things, right? But uh, sometimes those things are hard, right? Getting good sleep, eating well, exercising. It's, it's easy to just kind of want to curl up like Chris did under the covers. And, and hide for a while, which obviously is not the best way to handle what we're going through right now. So now I wanna know in the chat how you specifically are practicing self-care. What are you doing right now to practice self-care in this midterm environment that we're in? Take another minute, couple of three words. How are you practicing self-care right now? Dogs, time to read. Reading Harry Potter, walks, talking to friends, calling friends, exercise. Whoever's brushing their horse, I wanna come to your house because I miss mine. Staying on social media, right? So these are all great things and virtually none of these, if we think about it, are connected to our work, right? These are all personal things that we are, are doing for ourselves outside of our work. And that's wonderful, right? That means we are taking care of ourselves or we're attempting to do some of the things that we hear that, that we can take care of ourselves. But now I'm curious what you think your students are doing. Okay. Denise walks her sweet little dog. <laughs> so just take a second again, three words. How do you think or how do you feel that your students are practicing self-care right now? Carl says they're struggling. A lot of video games. A lot of video games. They aren't, they're numbing. More work, drugs. That's terrible, I'm sorry to hear that. Ignoring it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Robert wishes he knew, right? Yeah. We don't necessarily know, right? We, we don't know who they are behind that camera, especially if we're teaching remotely or if we're teaching predominantly remote in a hybrid course. It's very difficult to connect with them that way. They're kind of names on a screen. Um, Carl asks them how they are, right? That's crucially important to develop a kind of relationship with them where that's an okay question, right? They are sleeping a lot. So we said that, that sleep can be a good self-care, but sleep can also be a coping mechanism. Right, sleep can also be a coping mechanism that we use that can reveal some challenges that we're going through, right? So I think one of the things that we need to do is be able to say, this is what's happening to me emotionally. This is what's happen happening to me physically, right? I see it, I have a language for it. When you don't have a language for it, it becomes kind of shameful, right? You're not, you're afraid to say it to anyone else. So if we are providing some sort of language for it, Several of you said, you know, encouraging emails. I talk to my students. I give them space to share. Mostly we want to know that we're validated and that, that we're not alone in those feelings at this time, right? And we're not. Many of us are feeling the, the effects of the trauma, the effects of burnout, right? And students can feel burnout, right? They're, it's not occupational, but certainly their education probably at this time of their lives, especially if they're traditional students, is an occupation. Right. So how are they dealing with that? Are they throwing themselves into it? Are they backing away completely from it? How can we help them have a language to describe what might be happening to them, to encourage them to pay attention to those signs and to treat themselves well at this time? So let's go back to Chris. Right. Let's just take a couple of minutes. And, and based on that kind of review of some of the, liter the literature, 
Um, what do you think is happening to Chris here? You can feel free to type something in the chat or please unmute yourself if you want to share, you know, based on what we just talked about, what might be happening to Chris here? I think he's getting depressed. This is okay. Not... Hi, Scott. How do we know that? Just, I, in my opinion, just because he's wanting to shelter and hunker, hunker down, kind of dark mm -hmm. covers type of deal, you know? Yeah. I think we've all experienced it. Probably, mm -hmm. some of us have. You know, I've done the same thing. So mm -hmm. I'm overwhelmed, and when you do that, you kind of want a comforting blanket mm -hmm. thing, and you just kind of darkness. You know, get away from yeah. everything and hide. Yeah, literally, right? You want to hide. You want to cover up. Yeah, sure. yeah. So, yeah. So the depression is starting to come through. Um, overwhelmed, burnout. He used to get energy and passion from students, and now he wants to get away from them. He can't feel any energy from them. Downward spiral, right? Depressed and overwhelmed. Could be anxiety, right? We definitely, if you're experiencing burnout and if you're experiencing trauma, those things can pull out other potential um, areas that that are maybe you're prone to. So we mentioned depression, anxiety. It could be coping with alcohol or overeating, right? It, it could be isolation, really isolating yourselves. Um, from the rest of the world um, and isolating yourselves from individuals, right? You back off. One of the first things, one of the first things that I experienced with burnout was isolation. I backed away. No one really noticed, but I slowly backed away until I was as far away as I could get to stay okay, right? So Chris is in a situation where they need to think about what's happening. Is this something that I can get a handle on? Is this something that I might need additional help or support on? Right. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Becky now, who's going to talk to you about different levels of wellness. Okay, so Rebecca mentions to everybody that burnout really is characterized by sustained duress in a workplace environment. But they've done a good deal of research investigating the various dimensions of life that we engage in and have noted the fact that really it's the complex interaction of all of these that uh, contributes to overall quality of life. So obviously, if you have sustained duress in a workplace environment, which we all do at this present moment in time, it's highly possible that the interactions of some of these other areas will also be disturbed. So I'd like for you to take just a moment because they're all inter interrelated and take a look at the list and decide which of these dimensions of wellness have been negatively impacted by COVID. And just make note and write them down for yourselves. You can also provide them in the chat box. So of these eight different dimensions, which have had negative impact as a result of COVID have been negatively impacted. Got social, all of them, all of them. Trick question, all of them, <laughs> all, most of them. Intellectual mostly, yeah. So the research has indicated that a, a sustained decrease in quality in multiple dimensions has the potential to have a strongly negative impact upon the individual. Rebecca can, or actually, if go one back one second, Rebecca, I apologize. If you'll take just a moment now and look at the areas that for you were already not the healthiest dimensions. In other words, which areas were already lower than the others before the advent of COVID for you as an individual? And you don't need to share these with us, just make note of them and write them down for yourself because we'll come back to that idea. Okay. So well-being is related to the concept of wellness. Well-being is a word that we hear used a lot these days and there's not a single definition or a consensus about how this construct should, should really be defined. But in general, when we talk about well-being, we're talking about the presence of generally positive emotions, contentment, happiness, hope for the future, um, the absence of negative emotions like 
depression, anxiety, uh, worry. We're talking about general satisfaction with life, with the various dimensions of life we just looked at. We're talking about a sense of fulfillment and what we do and positive functioning and all the ways that we engage in life and with people. And another aspect of the definition is judging life positively, generally positively, and feeling good, both emotionally and physically. And this all comes from the CDC and I've provided the link for you there at the bottom. So let's talk about ways to work actively on cultivating a sense of well-being during the time of COVID. Number one, I think it's important for all of us to go back to that list and identify the weakest areas. We have a tendency in all things in life to apply more time and energy in those things that are happy and positive and feel good because they're happy and positive and they feel good. And we like that. Um, but the research suggests that what we should really do is look at those areas that are weakest, whether they are weakest because of external circumstances or whether they are weakest because of processes going on within ourselves and actively work on, on remediating those areas, the weakest areas, that's number one. Number two is once you have done that to employ regular practice and whatever the te techniques are, the actions that you are taking to try to remediate some of those weaker areas. The third is to go through and carefully identify, and this is, I really shouldn't be talking with you about this because I'm so bad at it for myself. But the third is to identify the sources of greatest stress in your life. Rebecca sort of hinted at this a little bit earlier, but we have a tendency a lot of the time, at least I do, to be st actively stressed out and frustrated by something and to totally ignore it. Walk right through it, totally ignore it, and do nothing to try to mitigate the source of that stress. And that's really not... Um, a good intelligent course of action because all that does is ensure that the status quo will continue, right? The last is to work at, to actively limit worry. And one of the ways that I have found that has worked for me and several of you mentioned it, and I will just mention it to the audience here as well and recommend that you do a little bit of investigation is to actively cultivate mindfulness. So what is mindfulness? Um, this is a word that is often very misunderstood. A lot of people associate it with yoga. And frankly, I can't stand yoga. For those of you who like yoga, I apologize. My spouse loves it, but I do not. Um, it's not yoga. Um, it does come out of meditative tradition. But really, these days, when people use the word mindfulness, what they mean is practices and techniques that work to bring you fully into the present so that you are neither experiencing negative emotions in the future in the form of worry about things that have not yet happened and are not here, and also bringing you into the present so that your mind is not cast back with negative emotions about things that have already happened. Neither of those things can help us for the most part in our present moment. So techniques that can help to bring you in the present, make you fully aware of where you are right now and give you a sense of, I am okay right now. I am okay right now. Those things help. So here are some general practical tips for fostering a sense of well-being um, in general. I mentioned stress, identifying stress and actively working on it a minute ago. So that if the definition of crazy is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result, then the definition of crazy where stress is involved is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result and being unhappy with the result that you get. So it's important to identify those real sources of stress and then identify ways that you can actively work to mitigate them so that you have a sense of control rather than either simply accepting them as a part of life or ignoring them. The next is that balance between all those dimensions of wellness is incredibly important for a sense of well being in life. However, right now with COVID, balance between work and life, particularly while working from home, is critical. Um, and there is an earlier presentation from the webinar series this summer that deals with that, um, helping to create a sense of balance between work and life while working from home. The next is to cultivate a growth mindset. I'm not a, not a huge fan of buzzwords myself. 
Um, and you're probably tired of hearing that word as well. So what I mean by growth mindset is realizing that our present circumstances are not static, that it's not going to be this way forever, that there will be a change and developing the mindset that we can always change our current abilities and our current skill sets, no matter what the present circumstances are, they can always improve. The next, and as you were all mentioning self-care techniques, it was interesting that this came up so frequently. The next is to be sure that you actually set aside personal time for yourself. That is incredibly difficult right now. I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old working from home, doing a job and lots of other obligations, and it is difficult. And I often feel guilty trying to craft time for myself personally, but I have learned that because that time is needful for me, because I am a profound introvert, and if I do not take the time to make personal time, then my mental and emotional health suffers, and then the mental and emotional health of the people who love me and live with me suffer as well. So we have to make time to do it. And the next is, if you are not a profound introvert like me, if you are an extrovert, then you need to set aside intentional social time and not feel guilty doing it or taking time away from other things because it is self-care for some people. It is needful for your health and well-being. So some practical tips for fostering well-being specifically during COVID are to number one, work on applying time management strategies like the Pomodoro technique where, you know, if you're working from home alone for contracted periods of time, hours on end, it, it's just draining. There's no way around that. So set a, a timer, work concertedly for 25 minutes and then get up, walk away and do something else briefly. Give yourself a break and then come back to the task at hand. It really helps to keep your mind fresh and to mitigate some of that sense of drain and overwhelm sitting in front of a computer. The next is to take brain breaks in whatever form that is for you. Sometimes I'll get up and just lift you know, weights for a second, or sometimes I'll get up and take a quick lap around the house, or sometimes I'll turn on some music for a moment, something to make your brain go do something else than what it has been doing. The next is to maintain normal routines as you normally would. That gives us a sense of normalcy, a sense of control over our lives when so many parts of our lives seem totally out of our control right now at the moment. Finally, to employ sound student support set techniques like tilt and best practices and remote engagement. And I say that because the better the students are functioning, the better the students feel, the better you as their instructor will function and feel. So these th two things are highly interrelated. I'm just gonna mention tilt. This is not what this presentation is about. There's an enormous amount of research behind this pedagogy. Um, it works very well, I can tell you from a personal perspective. It had a profound impact on my ability to clearly communicate what I wanted students to do. So the acronym stands for transparency in learning and teaching and the characteristics are that you are to very transparently and clearly communicate the purpose. Why are they doing the task? Why are they doing the assignment? How does it relate to course goals, program goals, career goals, and life goals? These things are important because if the students know why they're doing something, they're more likely to be willing to do it and to do it well. Next is the task itself, clearly stipulating everything involved and what it is that they have to do, making it clear. And the most important part here, I think, is recognizing that students are not expert learners. We are, they're not. They don't always know what to do, and there's always a hidden curriculum in everything we ask them to do. So stipulating those things clearly mitigates a lot of their stress. If they are less stressed, the product you get back is better. And if the product you get back is better, you are less stressed as well. Last is to stipulate the criteria. How is it going to be evaluated? How will they be assessed? And then in order to more clearly show them that, give them some examples of both excellent work and not excellent work, and then have conversations about why the excellent work product was excellent and why the not excellent product is not excellent. Heading into any assignment that way, you can see how you'd be a lot more likely to get back what you as a professor hope to get from students. Um, I'm 
forgot to mention one thing on the last slide, and it's that I emailed to Denise a transparent assignment template and a transparent assignment checklist that you can use to help convert your assignments to the TILT protocol. Finally, just some very general best practices in remote engagement. Number one, to regularly communicate to the entire class via course announcements. They're usually going to get an alarm that an announcement has been made that will cause them to log in. When they log in, they will see the announcement and they're more likely to stay actively involved in the course, participate in discussions and that sort of thing if they are repeatedly being drawn back to the course platform itself. Next, I work really hard, I teach for ECOR, to use the students' names in all written communication. And here is what I mean by that. I provide feedback on everything, every discussion, and yes, it is a bit time consumptive, but every discussion, every assignment. And what I'll do is as I'm saying to them, hey, this was a really great discussion post, I appreciate your engaging this way or whatever it is I'm saying, I start it with the name. Samuel, this was a fantastic Delilah. Every single bit of feedback starts with their name. And the research shows us that this makes them feel personally spoken to. This makes them feel connected. So it's a very good practice to use, particularly in a remote teaching environment. Um, next, I recommend holding virtual office hours. And these are hours that you are physically sitting there online so that if the students want to ask you questions, they can buzz in and do that. If they want to schedule a meeting to talk about uh, course content or to ask for help, it's times that they can do that. And one of the things I most frequently hear people say is, well, I do this and students don't come. Sometimes that's true. But I've also had students who genuinely wanted help and when they contacted me was those hours and we sat there and worked through the project remotely during those hours. So establish the hours, communicate to the students about them, maybe make frequent announcements and go, hey, just as a reminder, if you want to talk about something, people just like to pop in and decompress. Here are the two hours that I will be sitting in my virtual office online. Next, social presence. Um, try to create a sense of community by holding class debrief sessions or decompress sessions so that your students can get together and talk to each other about how a particular project or assignment went, if it went well, if it didn't go well. These don't have to be necessarily curricular. These can just be opportunities for the students to speak to one another. Um, finally, provide feedback in a timely fashion. This is good teaching practice, period, but it's even more critical right now during all of this physical disconnection. The students need feedback immediately as soon as possible after they complete an assignment or take a test. And this is because if too much time goes by, they're not going to remember what they did or why they did it. Your feedback will not have as much impact if they are still not actively in the mental place that they were in when they completed the assignment. So make sure that the feedback is very specific to what they did. There's nothing worse than getting a bad grade and there's no explanation for why you got that bad grade. Um, make sure that it's specific and make sure that you give it back to them very quickly. Create opportunities for engagement and learning with others. Um, investigate techniques for creating group interactive assignments and work in remote environments. Um, the more connected you can make the students feel to you, to each other, and to the course in general, the better their experience is going to be. I think if I surveyed everybody, the one thing that we would all say is everybody feels disconnected. Everybody feels disconnected. So the more that you can do to force or cause or create opportunities for interaction for everybody, the better everyone will be. Last. Create opportunities for dialogue. This does not have to just be via discussion post. It could be synchronous chatting. It can be um, a synchronous meeting. In any fashion that you can, see if you can get the students discussing. I want to hop in for just a minute, Becky, because there's some great stuff going on in the chat, specifically about virtual office hours and calling them virtual study halls or um, virtual student hours so that the students feel like that that is is more their time than they're coming to you for something specific right they have a place to go they know they'll find you and their peers there as well yep that's a great comment so if you'll just take a moment to catch up on chris here in our case study
And so now I'm going to turn the presentation over to my colleague. Thank you so much. All right. Um, I'm next, my part. Um, I'm Tamara Payne, and I will be doing the third and final section of our presentation. And so I wanted to go into the case study in regards to where he was um, before <laughs> the before COVID. So here we're looking at the fact that Chris, prior to his COVID and the shift, and I'm going to, I like to read my case study, so I'm sorry, <laughs> but prior to COVID and the shift of online instruction, Chris was an, an energetic professor with a love for his subject matter. He now finds that his course is not engaging and there is very little interaction with the students. His students appeared uninterested and disengaged. Most of the, most of the class do not participate in discussions or even turn on their cameras. Chris notices that many of the students are not grasping the concept being taught, which appeared apparent by the poor performance on exams and assignments. In, this pro in the process, Chris is finding himself overwhelmed with managing his class, but also sees that his students are overwhelmed as well. He feels he's losing his passion for teaching and he is losing his students in the process. So let's look at the um, trying to have an effective classroom management to avoid our burnout. So first we need to look at planning. So how do we achieve the planning? Um, one, you want to look at um, how can we achieve a desired goal? So what are the goals? So we have making sure that we have the learning objectives and those learning objectives are very clear making sure that we are looking at planning assignments that would allow us allow us to ensure that the students achieve these objectives. And also we wanted to look at how these would be basically implemented. Then we'll look at organization. So this is looking at some of the rules and procedures that we have in our class and having those align with the teaching strategies and actually and the subject matter as well. Um, one good thing to do in organizing, I am a big, per, uh, big believer in using the calendar because I used to have a lot of time management issues in my younger days. And so using a calendar had been very effective in improving my time management. And so that would help the students to know um, and see that, you know, this assignment is due on this day. Uh, this assignment will be open on this day. And so that helps to organize. Having things that we know where the discussions are, we know where the assignments are. Um, we have everything aligned in regards to what we're saying that those um, goals would be for the lesson and looking at how we are using our teaching strategies to implement this to help it to be better for us. So, you know, if you know the, the type of instructor that you are, the type of professor that you are, you want to make sure that you are doing things aligned to um, what you're uh, more attracted to, the things that you're more passionate about. And so all of those will work together. In looking at communication, you want to be sure that you are being clear and effective. Um, so one thing, the one way you can do it initially, of course, is through the syllabus, to communicate things through the syllabus, to make sure that you have, you know, what is the class the, talking about, um, the assignments. Um, usually what I do is I have assignments and I have a brief of instructions of the assignment, but then I follow up with more detailed ones on the actual assignment. I let the student understand like, hey, you know, this is how much this assignment would be worth within that. I talk about the discussions, how the discussions will be when they were open, when the discussion will be closed. So everything in my syllabus is clear. All of my students in the beginning of class, they actually do what we call a syllabus acknowledgement. And so they have to say, I, and put their name, have read and understood the syllabus. And so they, they do that for the beginning of each class. Um, and I have that in like a discussion form. So I have a list of everybody that that um, actually read it. And I use this because I have it as a safeguard because students will say, well, I didn't know. And I say, well, you know, you did use an acknowledgement. And so I'm doing this to ensure that you are um, looking at the syllabus and seeing what expectations are in the class. Um, also being sure that you are clear with what you're saying and trying to provide as much detail. Um, another thing that can be done on videos, I may do a video for um, a particular assignment and explain it. I use the syllabus, I use the detail from the assignment. I may have some type of an example and have this discussion and I have the video and I put it in to my announcements prior to the um, assignment being open for the class. 
Um, and so that kind of helps. And uh, um, a lot of students have given positive feedback with that. The other thing is motivation, is to create a learning environment that encourages social interaction. Um, and so that becomes motivating, having the students feel like they're involved, having giving um, good feedback to them, um, you know, just letting them know like their progress through the time. These things help motivate. You're doing a good job, you know, hey, you may, and you can even say to be motivating, you're not doing a good job, but this is some things that you can do in order to improve and have things better. And that goes back to also some communication. Monitoring, evaluate the activities and student progress. And so, you know, just look and see um, sporadically throughout the course, you know, where we are, how are students doing? Um, are they performing well on a particular activity? Um, a lot of times I know that when we use uh, D2L that um, you can go back and you can look at how students scored. And so to give you a graph and it'll show like kind of like the questions and some of the things that are there. And so, you know, these are really, really good in regards to looking at, you know, what you may want to implement. You may want to do some adjustments to class. You may want to communicate more things. And so monitoring is, is really good um, for not only for yourself, but students as well. Oh, I'm sorry. I went too fast. Okay, here we go. All right, so next is to incorporate uh, strategies to avoid burnout in the class. One is to incorporate your passion. I start my my psychology class this way. I love psychology, and all you know, all the students are always like, "Oh, you know, Dr. Payne." And so um, <laughs> I say that because I want them to um, feel that I am passionate, and I feel like that because I always tell them, "I say psychology is about everything. You breathe that psychology. What you're thinking with psychology. Anything, anything you do is psychology. You know, your love for your animals is psychology. You know, coming in here learning is that." And so for me, you know, I'm in and I'm trying to get, I have my energy up. And so I look at it as, you know, what made me love psychology? What made me love counseling? And so I'm always thinking that as I go into class and how can I get my passion over to the students? And so I'm always trying to think that and that maintains my passion for teaching, my passion for the subject, my passion for the students, my passion to just be creative inside the class. So incorporate, what is that? You know, some of the things that you like to do. One thing, I am a movie connoisseur. I love movies. I love movies. I love art. I love all these things. Well, I teach psychology and counseling. I just try to implement those things because those are things that I'm passionate about in order for me to um, do some of my lessons and teach my students. The other thing is virtual support groups and student breakout groups. If you ever come to Fort Valley, and you know anything and you heard anything about me, all students will say that Dr. Payne loves some group activities and assignments. I love them, I love them, I love them. I think that it's a great way to engage students. I think it's a way for them to support each other. Um, and so what I usually do is I'll have like breakout rooms and for them to like communicate, have some discussion. Um, and so for us, we do uh, blended synchronous learning. So I uh, always engage in my remote students that are uh, my synchronous students and my in-class students. And so we still do group activities, regardless of if they're remote, regardless of they're in class, they do them. And the, those students that are in class, they're basically the, the kind of like the hands-on for the person that is remote and they work together and they really enjoy it. And they actually help in regards to understanding some assignments because they're having discussion and they're talking. And then there's just times where they just doing some brainstorming. Maintain boundaries for a, a work-life balance. Um, it was uh, previously kind of talked about, but again, I just want to reiterate some of those things. Um, schedule some days that you uh, work and grade papers, read your discussions, and respond to student emails. Don't do that every day, all day, every day on weekends, all the time, because what happens is you miss out on the things that you might be enjoying. You miss out on things like um, not spending a lot of time with your family or friends, or it becomes very something that is inter interrupts your life. Um, just go ahead and engage in some of those hobbies and some interests and travel on the days in which you're not designated to do some work for school. Efficient grading. Uh, one, again, the detailed syllabus is very important because it should outline the requirements and about how the work would be how the work would be uh, graded and um, basically where things will be located when they're open, when they're closed. And so that helps in regards to students being able to submit things on time and knowing what they need to submit and try to grade the work in a timely manner. Again, go to that designated schedule when you will be doing that. And you can say that clear, like 
uh, work would be uh, graded seven days prior to um, the due date, um, after the due date. And then so the students will know when they will get that feedback and then maintain those due dates. So if you're saying that this is when this something will be in, then that's when they end. If you're saying this will be graded, then have that. If not, just communicate to the students that there may be a delay or something. Conduct a mid and end of the uh, semester evaluation. Um, I always say it's like a, a course evaluation for myself. And so you can ask the students in the mid part, you know, how things are going, what they're doing. You can ask them, give them a discussion question that is relevant to like, the processes of the class and then do one at the end of the semester. I tend to do one and I allow them to have that and give them extra credit. And I might ask a, a, just a, a question about, you know, the class and how he felt that the class was um, applied and what did it meet the goals and the learning objectives that were talked about in the very beginning. And so this helps for not only for course development, but also for personal development for me, because the student may say, hey, Dr. Payne, you're not um, responding, you know, in a more more of a timely manner, or you know, I really you weren't really clear on um, some instructions, and so that helps me. So as I go forward into the other classes, I know the things that I need to be sure that I'm working on. So then we talk about developing a resilient class. So the best way to build this resilience in a class is through interaction and through engagement. Mm -mm. Some reason my it's not making me go. I'm having a trouble with the next slide. It's not letting me go to the next slide. Thank you. All right. So some key experience to promote resilience is one: provide them with authentic evidence of academic success, their confidence. So provide them with feedback on the assignments and the and participation in the in the discussion. And so once they're involved in the discussion. So um, sit, have them say, you know, that's a good job. That's a very good point. Um, you know, that's something that can be applied. Well, how we apply that. And so students want to know that they are doing well. Students want to know that, you know, you see them. And so, you know, hey, you know, I see that your progress. I see that you're doing well. I see you have an understanding of, of the lesson, of the topic. I see that you know how to apply that to everyday life to show them that they are valued members of the community and have belonging. Allow the students opportunity to just share their thoughts and their ideas within the class and have it amongst them as a group and they can share it, um, you know, they can share it, do it in a group and then share it to the entire class. They can do it individually. Um, and that's something that students would like to see. They, uh, anyone wants to feel valued somewhere, wherever they are. Three is, um, in, um, excuse me, is reinforce feelings that they have made a real contribution to their community and usefulness. And so their community at this point can be a class community, but it can also be outside community. So give them feedback and make sure that they know that their contributions are valued. Have them understand that, you know, you see that there's a relevance to what they have for everyday life and in current situations. And four, make them feel empowered, potency. So. Allow the students to have input while using those evaluations. I talked about the mid, the mid um, semester evaluations at the end. Um, sometimes in my collaborate session, I do polls and ask them, you know, hey, what do you think about this? And yes or no, or they can have a multiple choice answer. And then to implement some of those suggestions within the course. And that way they will feel like they had a voice and to be empowered with that. All right. And so how to foster resilience by incorporating it in within the course work, uh, coursework. So one is learning style appropriate instruction. I am very big. I am my favorite word to describe myself for everything I do is eclectic. I love the word eclectic. Um, anybody sees me, they know I'm saying uh, eclectic. I love eclectic fashion. I love eclectic in teaching. I love eclectic instructions. Everything is eclectic. So when you are teaching, you have to consider the fact that all students are not the same type of learners. So when doing that, you need to you need to look at um, having those um, visuals. So there may be pictures. Uh, so a visual learner needs some pictures, some diagrams, illustration. You can put those in PowerPoints. You can use some uh, pictures in regards to uh, illustration, in regards to some videos. 
Um, calisthenics, and when you're looking at the experience and, and observation and have activities and use a lot of experimentation, those hands-on students may have assignments and activities that will engage in them. And you can actually do that in online instruction. Um, tend to do it a, a lot. I use a lot of, again, movies and videos and then let them use their observation and say, what did you see? Um, you know, how could this have been different? Uh, those type of activities. And those who teach in the sciences, of course, some lab experimentation that you can do online. Um, in auditory, the listening, having lectures and using recordings for those students, they can go back and listen. A lot of times when I do um, some activities, I'll record them so students can always go back and they can um, listen to what was done there. And then they can go back and kind of like use it and implement it in something else. And then you have those that have the read and writing. And I use the a lot of this, the BARC learning styles. Um, that's the one that I use because it's only four. And I like things to be kind of simple. So the reading, the read and writing is reading the materials and writing some type of summary so that they so that you can reiterate. I'm very good at like writing things down and then I might type it up, but that helps me to know and understand the lesson. So incorporating some of these things inside of the lesson. Relatable discussion, having real life situations and making things, app, um, app, making applications so that everybody understands that, hey, this is, you know, you can take this and apply to something else. Use of reflection to help to make um, some of the person, use of personal beliefs, um, expectations and bias and make those evident to people because sometimes they don't know that they have those. And this is how you see how it have an impact in the world and how the student or you perceive the world. Create projects and use media. Remember, I am that movie connoisseur, love it. I always implement movies, especially when I teach counseling. I get like, for example, if I do a substance abuse, I get them to find a movie with a person who is suffering from uh, substance abuse and then that's their client. And they work with that client throughout the course and with the assignment. And so I use videos and of course some PowerPoints and I love, I'm a meme person. So I try to put funny memes aside to be the creative and I encourage my students to do the same. Um, so student input in a journey, use evaluations again and in-class polls that so that they can have input on things that are going well or not going well with them. Service learning, to implement an activity that's outside of the classroom and associate those with those learning activities. So, you know, students can go out um, in education and they can do tutoring and after school programs. Um, people that are in plant science can go out and assist in planting trees um, or, or sciences and, and planting trees and, and help with urban gardens. Um, just kind of some kind of hands-on and do demonstration outside with students in local schools and cooperative learning. Um, so that is being a part of a group and teaching lessons and technique where students interact with each other and so that they can acquire some of those elements that they're getting within the lesson. So for me, I love last night, I just had a class and my class, we they did a create a uh, family. And so they worked in the groups of four. They had to create a family. And actually, they had to do role play. And they role play being each person. So there was a mother, a father, and there was two children. So each student was a, ch a child. And then one person had to become the counselor. And then they still had to do the role play and do a counseling session. And we did all of this in the collaborate. So all of this stuff was done virtually. And so they loved that. Like, they, you know, they're like, OK, next week who goes next week and so this is something that I can observe and I can also I use a rubric with everything and so I use a rubric and that kind of helps me to make sure that I'm organized and then I make sure that they see that rubric so when we do all of these activities that all of these activities they know what the expectation is in class that helps that helps for you to eliminate some burnout and it helps for them to reduce some of their anxieties that they may have in that classroom. And so as we go and we start looking at Chris and looking at what Chris is doing, how can we actually implement some of those things? So one is that Chris says, okay, I needed to find out what my passion was. And I also need to provide some passion and some interaction and engagement within the class. So some of the things that Chris started to implement so that he can um, be, be better and avoid burnouts is he provided students with clear expectations and instructions for all of the assignments. He also set schedules by adding due dates and reminders in the course calendar so that not only do the students know when everything was due, but to remind him that they were due as well. Um, 
the, to incorporate movies, movies and media. Um, one thing my class does is one of my classes, they do presentations and we use Pinterest. And so they take Pinterest and they do, uh, they pin different things. So for substance abuse, they may have opiates and they pin everything. And I give them different areas in which they have to cover. So they use those pins and then they discuss what those pins are and explain all of the information. And once they do that, is you know, the class is like, okay, we see in pictures, everything's audio. And they, so they like those types of things. Also, I implement, um, at the end, they do cahoots and which is a little, um, a quiz and they do the quiz. And so that goes down to even what my next part is when looking at the review, we do those and then the students to get the highest points, I give them extra credit. So if you got the, you the top three, you get extra credit for that. And that motivates students that they want to participate um, with those assignments and activities. The other thing is discussion. You, you close some debates, have the students get involved in, in and get involved in debates and have their ideas. They're able to bring their ideas and their thoughts and, and they can put them all together and everybody can kind of like learn from each other. Group assignments, use breakout rooms. Um, always using breakout rooms. Last night, my students, you know, they had to go and I said, okay, well, go ahead and practice some of your, your mock counseling and go ahead and do some mock counseling. So they went in breakout rooms. So I set up a breakout room for them inside of our main class, but outside and collaborate each group, each of my learning teams, all the learning teams have their own room. So anytime they want to meet, they can go in there and meet. Um, do send a mid and end of the semester course evaluation so that again, you can get feedback and you know what you may need to adjust or revise. Um, you may also know what you're doing well or some things that are give a strength. And lastly, reevaluation of your courses and prepare for the next semester. So all of the feedback that you get, the things, take notes of things that may not have gone right, whether it was technology, whether it was an assignment, whether it was something that you, you know you may have done or the students, um, didn't so students did or didn't do have that and allow that to prepare for the next semester so that you won't have to get the same those same things you can just keep going and you can keep going and you can build again it's about your professional development and course development and as well as student developing within the class and so these things were, were helping Chris and so Chris is like so happy and great he's loving teaching again and his students are very much very active. They are engaged. They are now taking those cameras and turning those cameras on so they can be seen. They are getting good feedback and he is getting this uh, feedback as well. And so this piece will conclude my section. And I'm hoping that um, uh, everybody got something out of that. And if you have any questions, I guess that all of us will be here to answer any questions that you may have. Thanks Thank you, you everyone so much. This I, I love how you talked about like how we can take care of ourselves, but also our students. I mean, I think this is so important and timely right now. And just a reminder that, you know, everyone is struggling in some way at some level. And just to remember, um, just to give everyone a little grace and, and, and some strategies that you guys have given us to help with that. So thank you so much to all three of you for doing this. And thanks to all of you who have been joining us with these webinars, uh, couldn't do it without you. So I'm gonna stop the recording, but if folks, you know, if our presenters can stick around and if you guys have questions, we'll, we'll keep going for a few minutes.